Okay, so I'm here with Jesse Hake, and today we are going to discuss universalism and hell. So Jesse, if you just want to take a moment to introduce yourself, talk about some current projects you're working on, uh, you know, what got you into Christianity, discussing you know, hell and universalism. Yeah, thank you, Eric. It's great to be with you on your show, and I'm excited for the conversation. I grew up uh, in the Christian faith. My dad's a, a pastor and a missionary, and um, I grew up thinking that um, any kind of consideration of universalism would be uh, entirely out of line with, you know, everything that Jesus clearly taught and, uh, you know, that was taught throughout the New Testament by Paul and others. And it uh, was just uh, a terrible, you know, uh, kind of liberal doctrine. So, you know, and I grew up in a loving family. Um, I mean, you know, not perfect, obviously. Uh, we have our issues and all of that, but really never was dissatisfied with the faith that I grew up with as a child, um, which is kind of atypical. You know, a lot of missionary kids or pastors' kids have uh, have kind of a tough experience. And um, But I, you know, I, I love my faith. I love Jesus. And uh, it was only like in the last uh, maybe even eight years or so that I began to seriously, in my reading and thinking, um, theologically, exegetically, um, began to consider that, wow, maybe I, you know, I was raised in a, in a pretty widespread kind of Christian teaching and, and thinking that is just plain wrong. And that, you know, the majority of Christians have been wrong about this over history. And that's a crazy thing in, for me to start thinking, because I have um, like every reason, every problem you could have with universalism, you know, I still take them seriously. Uh, mm -hmm. That I take Jesus's teachings extremely seriously and, uh, and love, you know, love, love him, love his teachings. Um, so that's, you know, that's a problem if, if he doesn't teach that and uh, the church's condemnation of it, I converted to orthodoxy uh, a few years ago, maybe five years ago after looking at it with my family. Uh, my wife wasn't quite so excited about it as I was, you know, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, it, it, you know, if the, if the church condemns orthodoxy, I take that seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there's many great saints who clearly did not believe in universalism. I mean, some that mm -hmm. do, but you know, right. if there's all these, all these great saints, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the issue, kind of pastoral question of like, does universalism cause a kind of complacency or make life just seem pointless? Like, what what, what are we all here for? If we're all going to be saved anyway, that's just mm -hmm. this, you know, or, or it's um. A kind of um, you know injustice, like no res, you know it's an unsatisfying resolution at one mm -hmm. one level from our current perspective of suffering and, and watching so many people suffer around us. Um, so that's a problem. And then yeah. I love yeah. C.S. Lewis and C.S. Lewis is like this is the one thing George McDonald's wrong about. You know I love George McDonald, but here he's wrong. And you know, so I've got I take all those things seriously, but. Um, I've been interested in it following um, a couple of different authors, particularly um, Brad, <coughs> Bradley Jersak, uh, mm -hmm. David, David Bentley Hart, um, have been really convincing to me in my reading. Um, Likewise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For I mean, for me, you know, universalism um, just seems like the right uh, teaching. It seems like it seems logically correct, morally correct. Um, you know, and, and for me too, the notion of eternal conscious torment, just from a, you know, prima facie perspective seemed false, right? Yeah. The idea that you have this infinite creator who creates out of predilective love, uh, is open to relationship, you know, an infinite relationship, you know, um, and the doctrine just seemed morally unintelligible, logically nonsensical and, um, I start to engage with the universalist literature, start to read the Bible a lot more, guys like Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, David Bentley Hart, and it became very persuasive to me that this is almost certainly false. So yeah. That's what got me into this specifically. You have, um, yeah, I began reading, you know, cases that, uh, you know, like the Apostle Paul had no concept of eternal conscious torment. And that just blew my mind. I mean, I had grown up with the whole, like, what is salvation? Salvation is being rescued from eternal conscious torment. Like, it was part of the definition of what happened on the cross. You know, Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus had to be able to, you know, 
it took an infinite God being uh, killed in order to offset what I deserved, which was eternal conscious torment. I mean, that's how I was raised. Mm -hmm. So it was crazy to me when I started to read material that said, actually, you know, a lot of really solid scholarship from a wide range of, of scholars, you know, in different perspectives, they all agree that Paul had no concept of eternal conscious torment. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, he's either an annihilationist or some or kind of, you know, universalist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, ap 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 Apocatastasis, like the mm -hmm. rest of all things, universalism. And uh, that those are category, those are categorical kind of things I had never um, taken seriously. So I began reading, and, you know, C.S. Lewis was definitely an annihilationist. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't advocating eternal conscious torment. Now, C.S. Lewis doesn't get explicit about that, but I began to realize um, that really the two the two legitimate options, you know, it seems like are either uh, apocatastasis, this restoration of all Full things, restoration. or, yeah. or uh, some type of annihilationism, you know, where where we're just like <clears throat> some people we know right now aren't really ever going to be fully created and they'll just be wiped out from existence but of course that <laughs> you start trying to put it into right blunt terms like that and it's like you know it starts uh, being almost as problematic as you know eternal conscious torment mm -hmm. in certain regards so right the, the the idea that god would even create a state of affairs whereby yeah. annihilation is even possible that yeah. he, he cannot yeah. bring these creatures to yeah. full restoration it yeah, is right. becomes problematic in itself. Yeah. That he wouldn't complete a creative project, you know, like, yeah, he would lose that, in some sense. Yeah. And that some of us would be, um, would be based, yeah, abortive or, or really never properly started by God, because that's the only way to kind of save it. In my opinion is mm -hmm. to say that, well, God actually never really properly started that project. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> right. that, that was just something, but, uh, I mean, that just it just falls apart um, rationally, and uh, and and I've come to believe because I I um, you know I'm not a fundamentalist with regard to scripture, but mm -hmm. I do take scripture very seriously. You know, I believe it's Holy Spirit inspired and uh, you know a powerful means of um, God's grace in our lives and all of that. So I I take it seriously, and if if the Apostle Paul and Christ you know teach um, annihilationism or eternal conscious torment even. I'd have to wrestle with that seriously. Um, oh, I can't, for sure. Yeah. I can't just brush that aside. So, yeah. All right. Well, that was great. I think that was a really good opening. So we'll get into the first question here. What is universalism, annihilationism, and eternal conscious torment? So we kind of touched upon it a little bit, but if you want to expand on it a little bit. Or... Yeah, I think it's a helpful three categories. Um in my upbringing in uh, kind of the American evangelical and specifically reformed, uh, you know, Calvinist tradition, um, these things also overlapped with soteriology, you know, the, uh, doctrines of salvation. And you would have questions like, um, you know, how many, how many people, um, <clears throat> you know, is, uh, is it inclusivism? or exclusivism and some of these categories that related specifically to who's saved and who's not. But I think that um, those three categories are really helpful. I would say that um, annihilationism is the idea that um, persons can be removed from existence. You know, uh, somehow uh, God allows a free spirit to begin to, uh, you know, take shape among all the other free spirits, um, all the other persons in, in, you know, in existence. And yet they end up, um, choosing life apart from God, which is nothing, you know, um, mm -hmm. God is the life of life. God is, you know, the being of being. Um, and so a choice, a choice away from God is, is a choice ultimately of non-existence. Mm -hmm. So C.S. Lewis advocated that you get, get that in the great divorce, um, you get this hysterical and amazing images near the end of the book where a wife is talking to her husband, who's actually a theater, you know, he's, he's really into theater and, and he's um, basically been play acting all his life, kind of made this whole big character out of himself. And uh, he thinks he's hot stuff. And his wife is like, <laughs> you know, you're so self-deluded. 
and he's shrinking as he's talking to her. And he, he shrinks down into this tiny little crack in the ground of heaven. So she's in heaven trying to persuade him to come with her. Mm-hmm. And, and he's like, no, no, no. Like, I got it. I got it all going on. I'm cool. But as he's talking about how, how great he is. He's he just fizzling of, away. <laughs> yeah. In, in, in insignificance. So it's that idea that um, a rejection of reality, a rejection of life with others, um, which in this life entails suffering and death ultimately, but that mm-hmm. that rejection is ultimately, uh, you know, uh, a choice for non-existence. And uh, so that's annihilationism. annihilationism. And there's a lot, a lot of um, teaching in the Bible that that points in that direction, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, eternal conscious torment. I'm not 100 percent sure if David Bentley Hart kind of coined that phrase, but he sure hammered away on it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, he flips the script. And I think he did coin the phrase infernalist, uh, you know. Yeah. Correct, infernalist. But, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so he's a rhetorical, you know, um, kind of he uses like thor's hammer when he's writing and oh yeah smashes away rhetorically someone said uh, real quick that david bentley hart floats like a butterfly but stings like a bee and i I thought that was the perfect description of Hart. (laughs) it's just so true that's an old (laughs) boxing uh, i think yeah like an old boxing phrase yeah yeah that he that's uh that's a great description of him Mm -hmm. so eternal conscious torment is uh, a very um it's kind of focused in on the on a particular idea of hell and you know that is that hell is uh first of all it has duration it exists in a in a kind of time similar to the time as we experience it now and and it's endless and uh and it's uh, so we're going to be um, conscious of our suffering for an endless duration of time as we know it now which is as you said earlier when you start to try to really articulate it mm-hmm. like a psychologically incomprehensible concept i mean it, right. it's, it's so horrible you know you, you just recoil at the mm-hmm. real contemplation of it or, or articulation of it so and then uh, finally <clears throat> uh restoration of all things the, a greek phrase that shows up i think only once in paul but uh, gets used a lot by some of the church fathers apocatastasis or universalism um, the idea that all are saved, ultimately all all are restored, um, is uh, is a is the third option. So I think kind of logically, those are the three basic categories. There's tons of nuance within mm-hmm. uh, within right. uh, within all of them, um, but those are three good general categories. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting to note too that the idea of a literal heaven and hell doesn't find its origin in uh, Judaism or Christianity. It's really a Greek origin you know plato articulates it in a rather unambiguous fashion you know much more than the bible does yeah yeah the but in the old testament you really have um you know this kind of very nebulous uh, realm of the dead right um it's it's not that similar like uh from a tartarus or a, you know or hades mm-hmm. but it's it's not it's not dwelled upon much or talked about much and it's just kind of a um a gray you know deep holding house of the dead and uh and yeah there's not a concept of punishment torture you know that kind of thing in the old testament um or really a whole lot i mean there's little glimmers that you know different people but of, of like a, a resurrection you know right so it, yeah that comes in um very strongly um the combination of like um you know jewish thought really matured and um you know was very fruitful in as it interacted with um, with some persian thought some greek thought and uh Mm -hmm. began to develop a lot more of these concepts and and then there were debates you know among you know there are all these different schools and uh and kind of different theological positions and debates that were taken uh by jewish thinkers before the new testament period um you know that that are inherited by christianity i would say Right. Great, man. That's great. Um, all right. Let's see here. Oh, my laptop's a little messed up. Give me a moment. Okay. Question two. So universalism was at its most numerous in the first 500 years of the church. So what happened? You know, to my understanding, it disappeared for quite a while. And then in the 19th century, it started to pick up more a bit. So what would you say happened there? Yeah, that's a super complex question. And yeah. Uh, really important one i don't think there's any one simple answer to it but um something 
something substantial definitely seems to have happened. And when that's the case in history, usually, you know, you've got multiple reasons, right? Layers, mm -hmm. layers of reasons over time. Um, Dr. Valeria Romelli, uh, who's written some very influential books on the history of the, the doctrine and teaching around apocatastasis, um, once said that she was working on a book, she has a lot of health issues and, and this hasn't come out. I, I really would love, to, love it if she could finish it, but um, she said she's working on a book that is on the political, theological, pastoral, ecclesiastical, social, historical, and even linguistic causes for the rejection of the doctrine of apocatastasis or universal restoration in late antiqu antiquity by the Church of the Empire. So she puts that in quotes. Uh, that's kind of key to her thinking. Hmm. The Church of the Empire, mainly under the influence of Justinian in the East and Augustine in the West. So she hints at where she's going with her answer to that question of, of what, <laughs> what caused this. Um, something to do with uh, Christianity becoming a faith of the powerful and the, and the mainstream, you know, faith. Mm -hmm. And um, something to do with Justinian's uh, relationship to the doctrine. And uh, he's, of course, the one that's overseeing the Fifth Ecumenical Council, where these famous anathemas are issued um, Afterward, there's a ton of controversy about those anathemas. Are they, uh, some scholars don't include them, don't consider them to have been issued by the council itself and just to be kind of tacked on by some of Justinian's um, uh, scribes, you know, his, his kind of court scribes uh, after, <clears throat> after the fact. But anyway, she says Justinian in the East and then Augustine in the West. Augustine, of course, um, there's debate about, you know, how well he really read Greek and right. you know, he was yeah. a preeminent Latin uh, rhetorician, you know, legal rhetorician. He actually taught rhetoric in the emperor's own court in Rome, you know, promoted up from the colonies or from the provinces, you know, North Africa. And uh, but there's some indication that he made some basic grammar errors, you know, when it came to his understanding of Greek and his teaching of um, you know, the doctrine of his particular version of the doctrine of original sin, particularly when he got very polemical, you know, back and forth um, <clears throat> over that doctrine later in life. And uh, he begins to, you know, he actually writes about the, um, the misericordia, the, 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 um, the gentle hearted ones, you know, uh, Augustine describes, and he says there's seven different types of universalists and he doesn't condemn wow. them. Now, a couple a, a few, he says, these are these are heretical, but um, the majority of them, he's not saying, you know, they're they're heretics. He's just saying, I disagree with them. You mm -hmm. know, he, right. he disagrees with them, but he describes them as the big-hearted ones or the gentle, you know, the 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 merciful ones. The merciful ones, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's um, <clears throat> there's, but his theology becomes so he's he's such a systematically brilliant thinker. And um, so profound in all kinds of good ways that his theology just kind of carries. Um, I mean, all subsequent, you know, uh, Latin-based, uh, you know, Western theological thought has a massive owes a massive debt to Augustine in many wonderful ways as well. But but some of that uh, thinking about um, the nature of the fall and um, soteriology got got locked into theologically ideas about. Um, a kind of legal guilt, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, you're condemned and you're condemned once and for all and you're condemned to hell. And right. so theologically, um, Ilaria Romelli seems to say, you know, there's some some seeds sowed by Augustine that really were influential. And then some of the politics actually around Justinian and, um, <clears throat> you know, politics. I mean, the doctrine that uh, you're going to burn you know and be conscious of your torment forever in hell is a powerful Very. Uh, weapon you know it's mm -hmm. a terrible weapon so it it is used to control people um and uh, there's actually debate among um some of the early church fathers explicitly about a number of them would say things you know maximus makes he says there's debate about whether Maximus is a universalist or not. Um, and But one of the things he says at one point is, I could give you the more wonderful mystery. I could explain to you the full and wonderful mystery 
but I'll leave it at this for now. And he's talking about, you know, we're going to die. We're going to be destroyed. And he, he leaves it there. He doesn't mm. go on to the full restoration, but that was a very common. Now he's living after, you know, just after the, um, the possible condemnation at the fifth ecumenical council. He's in a, in a charged um, environment with regard to that doctrine, but he also probably very fully subscribed to an idea that was common among the early church fathers. Several of them, Gregory of Nanziensis, Nanziensis is explicit about this. Um, of course, his good friend Nyssa, you know, doesn't bother and just gets, you know, puts it right out there. But a lot of the church fathers are clear that they personally believe in universal salvation, but they're not going to preach it from the pulpit mm -hmm. because they believe that it causes confusion to people and, right. and allows for a kind of moral laxity. And, um, and that that's a they, they have a positive motive there, but it's also the flip side of this fact that the doctrine of hell is such a powerful tool that can be abused. Then you mm -hmm. know so you might have a a pastor who really loves his people and says I'm not I'm not going to just blatantly preach universalism because they don't want to confuse and cause my people to stumble. That's a that's a good you know you can see a, a kind of generous motive there whether right. they're right or wrong, but. Um, but then you take someone who's trying to hang on to power, whether they're a bishop or, you know, an emperor or someone uh, and, and to hang on to power. Now they're going to, they're going to, you know, preach some hell and brims, you know, fire and brimstone kind of, you know, not get in line people um, or mm -hmm. you go to hell. And right. that happens. That certainly happens uh, whether it's consciously intentionally, um, but it, it becomes a doctrine that's so, um, fully wrapped up in the theological structures of soteriology and what Christ did on the cross that, you know, it doesn't even need to be conscious anymore. I mean, emperors and bishops and popes just had this power over people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like they were, they were calculating, you know, what's a doctrine I can use to, to control these people. They had it. It had been given to them. It was supposedly sanctioned by the fifth ecumenical council. It's what, you know, it was what, it's what they believe was taught in the New Testament. So it became a powerful weapon. Um, but anyway, the, you could go on and on. And oh, ask, it's a big yeah, question. Yeah. Deep question. Psychological implications. I know you, you and That's I have some fun chat. Abs absolutely. That. Yeah. And I think you could go into the psychology of this uh, more too. You know, it is a psychological weapon and it's powerful. As you yeah. said, you know, it's a terrifying notion that we may be tortured forever in this eternal torture chamber. And, you know, Nietzsche's idea of hell, he thinks hell came into existence so that the weak could justify their suffering and enjoy knowing the strong would face a comeuppance that would either equal or exceed their suffering. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you, you know, Nietzsche contrasts, uh, you know, slave morality with master morality, where master morality, uh, the values surround pride, wealth, courage, uh, independence, Whereas yeah. slave values are you know, equality, fairness, uh, patience, humbleness, justice, and essentially thinks that there was a transvaluation of values that, you know, mm. the slaves didn't have enough strength to physically attack the powerful. So they cleverly inverted values. And so, you know, the, the masters were deemed evil and the slaves were deemed good. So, you know, I, I certainly think that it has a lot of psychological implications because as david bentley hart has said before some people want there to be this kind of hell to get back at people and you know it's that's an awful notion but it is certainly true yeah yeah no that that makes sense i think um sadly we are we do have some really dark and, and deep personal motivation yeah. resentment uh, resentment mm -hmm. and bitterness. and and those you know some of that's very understandable in the case of people who are terribly, you know, abused and traumatized. And uh, like, um, you know, <clears throat> we, we want there to be a kind of justice, you know, mm -hmm. for, for, for these oppressors. And, and we're all, you know, we're all oppressors in certain regards and, Absolutely. Uh, and victims of, of um, suffering in other regards. But yeah, uh, a spiritual kind of health though, you know, a spiritual, like a life-giving spiritual uh, walk is ultimately going to be leading you into the ability to forgive, you know, and, and it's mm -hmm. easy for me to talk about, you know, I've, I've, I'm not a child who suffered, um, you know, sexual abuse or something in my mm -hmm. childhood, you know, so, but, 
but even there, um, where there's, there's terrible trauma, you know, health means being able ultimately to let, let go of that mm-hmm. and be, being able to overcome uh, and, and ultimately uh, an, an amazing <clears throat> kind of vision uh, forgive. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I can understand that desire to want to seek justice for awful things that have happened to you. I mean, it makes sense. Um, but I think the only moral kind of justice when we square it up with with God and his attributes, his infinite attributes, would be something akin to purgatory, or as I heard David Armstrong say before, cosmic rehab. You know, yeah. <laughs> so that's a form of justice where, you know, the person undergoes change and yeah. uh, correction and it's reformatory yeah. instead of, you know, just perpetual torment forever and ever that results in yeah. nothing. There's even even more explicitly, George McDonald says, you know, justice, ultimately justice is when the one who did the wrong um, does the right thing. So, you know, yeah. in, in the place of the wrong that they did. So, you know, uh, and that, that is, that is deeply satisfying to think that um, I am responsible to do the things I should have done or to um, do the things rightly that I've done wrongly. And that that's a responsibility I have. It, it's, it's profoundly empowering mm-hmm. um, and satisfying, you know, at, at this deep level. So, um, and George McDonald has talked about that. Uh, Jordan Wood, uh, a contemporary, a young contemporary Maximus scholar, talks a lot about that and mm-hmm. draws that out of Maximus as well. So that, and it's right in line with what you were saying from, you know, David Armstrong, um, the rehab um, of purgatory is ultimately... Um, a continuation of this life's responsibility to say, um, I need to repent. I need to turn from the way I, I do things uh, in a negligent way or, uh, or a hurtful way and do them uh, in, a, in a right way. They, uh, Jordan Wood even goes kind of wildly into this zone of um, we transcend time ultimately in our, you know, in our human personhood uh, and, you know, can, write all of history which is a a kind of wild um you know transcendental way of thinking about that whole topic but um but a beautiful one yeah absolutely awesome okay so question three what did jesus believe regarding hell so a lot of even atheist scholars like bart ehrman um agree that jesus didn't teach anything about eternal conscious torment it was more of an annihilationist perspective so what are your thoughts on that yeah that's a Another good question. You uh, you really got them lined up. Um, yeah, I would I would fully agree that the majority consensus among scholars right now is that Jesus Christ taught annihilation annihilationalism, not universalism, um, but certainly not eternal conscious torment either. But that comes as a surprise to a lot of people because um, we just you know hear all the language of you know the the uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth and you know. Um, the outer darkness that that is in Christ's teachings, and um, and we assume that's all of that terrible, uh, very visually you know gripping imagery is uh, describing eternal conscious torment. But um, another another really great scholar um, has written a book, The Geography of Hell in the Teaching of Jesus, uh, Gehenna, Hades, the Abyss, the Outer Darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Talk about a long title. Uh, that's <laughs> Uh, Papianos, um, and a really scholarly work, again, concludes that Christ, although he has some universalist language, is um, is an annihilationist. And the basic, the basic thinking behind that is that um, the fires that are talked about in the prophets, you know, these, these um, <clears throat> fires of the age or, uh, or eternal fires, um, as they're often translated, um, that show up in some of the later Old Testament prophets and then are picked up in, you know, their intertestamental literature, like the Enochic literature, and then Jesus Christ uses the same language and imagery. Um, those actually come from battlefield imagery, like in the Middle East, where after a great battle, um, all of the um, kind of, you know, refuse and bodies and everything would be cleaned up by building these massive fires, and um, there would be a burning that would take place. And, um, the idea is that these are <clears throat> divine fires um, set by God and maintained by God. And the uh, 
the idea of um, a fire of the age, um, you know, that the Ionios uh, fire that, that we translate as eternal fire is actually a fire that consumes all of time. It consumes the entire age. It, it consumes time as we know it, time itself. Um, so that um, the entire age is burned up in a kind of <laughs> purifying fire. Um, and all of the, uh, all of the, <clears throat> All of all that's evil, um, all that is um, against God, opposed to God, is utterly annihilated, uh, purified, burned away. Uh, and what's left is, um, you know, the the victorious kingdom of God. And uh, so it takes this kind of old um, Middle Eastern uh, battlefield imagery, and it's very colorful and powerful. But it's actually a profoundly, you know, positive message. If if God is a good God, God is uh, burning away evil purifying mm -hmm. the world of evil and we live in a world that is a mixture of god's imminent you know presence with us and obvious suffering and evil and uh, and the wheat and the tares right that christ teaches so um even though the majority of scholars uh are annihilationists with regard to christ and even though i have uh, i have a little history training i have a master's degree in history from saint andrews university in scotland um i'm not a bible scholar but I'll be gutsy and just <laughs> say, <am> <laughs> you know, so uh, my opinion is, uh, you know, that Christ actually does teach um, the restoration of all things. Um, and, and I actually just have a blog post on my Jesus and the Ancient Path blog uh, about this because um, I was just uh, listening to something that Jordan, uh, Jordan Daniel Wood talks about with regard to Maximus. And he draws out the fact that Maximus in a teaching on Jonah um, Maximus says, look, there's this apparent conflict in the book of Jonah, right? God says, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. And then God doesn't destroy Nineveh. Of course, Jonah's not so happy about that. He was kind of <laughs> looking forward to Nineveh's destruction, going back to the, what you were saying about Nietzsche. And, you know, mm -hmm. our, um, but Maximus resolves the tension in the book of Jonah by saying, look, our destruction and our salvation are always the same thing. It's two sides of the same point. And Maximus is explicit about that. In, in this exposition of the book of Jonah. And um, uh, Jordan Wood says, this is, this, is, um, this is all through Maximus the Confessor, this idea that we create false selves, that we, we create these kind of false realities um, <clears throat> because we're free spiritual creatures, we have the ability to create false worlds uh, and false versions of ourselves that we insert into things and uh, demand, you know, make demands and, and claim ownership over others who are actually free and, you know, independent creatures of God. Um, but we, we claim that they somehow owe something to us or belong, belong to us. And so it becomes a terrible world of suffering and evil. Um, but that um, the destruction of this false world that we're all, you know, implicit in, that we're all caught up in, um, the destruction of this false world is also our own salvation because, the self that wants to um, enjoy another person as an entirely free agent, you know, not as a form of possession, but to say um, your, you know, <clears throat> your creaturely freedom before God is a delight to me. And, uh, you know, and to enjoy the love of God and receive the love of God, that part of myself, the true, my true self um, is set free, you know, by this destruction of my false self. So, as that is all through the teachings of, say, Maximus the Confessor, according to Jordan Daniel Wood, um, you can roll that back. And Jordan, Jordan points this out that it's, it's certainly present in Paul. You know, Paul says mm -hmm. explicitly, um, uh, you know, you're only saved because you're, you are crucified. You're, you're killed in Christ. Uh, your old man has to die that the new man might live. And you start to see the same thing in Jesus. Jesus, you know, talks about having to go back into the mother's womb and be born again. He says, um, only if you learn to die, will you live? You know, um, only those who um, who die will live. Christ has all these yeah. teachings like that. So you see that uh, and, and the, you know, his parable of the wheat and the tares, where he says, don't try to unwrap these things like it's it's beyond your capacity. Let God separate, you know, the wheat from the hair from the tares. Um and yet, Oops. every every one of Christ's teachings is this um, is this unbelievable dilemma that he presents us with. Like every single parable, every, we're always left divided, right? Cut to the 
up to the marrow, the, the sword um, of scripture. That um, So we're left, um, in a sense, having to separate the wheat and the tares, but only in our own heart. Okay, so the teachings of Christ continually demand that. And um, I think a lot of the kind of really apocalyptic <coughs> uh, judgment language that Christ gives is best understood as a judgment now, in this moment of me. So I am, um, I am being forced to say, how am I the goats? You know, how am I the sheep? And, mm -hmm. and I need to make a choice. Let me now right. be judged. Okay, I was a goat, you know, running the yeah. wrong. Let me turn and be a sheep and, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and repent. You know, so um, it, it's, not, it's not about a final uh, judgment in a temporal sense, in a sequential sense. It's about right. a final judgment in an ultimate sense that mm -hmm. I am being judged by God himself, my own creator, in a very final way. But that judgment is ongoing. It's unique. So when I hear the gospel read in liturgy, I'm being judged and I'm being called yeah. to uh, so In the I, here and now. In the it, here and know, now. Yeah. Exactly. And, I, and, and real quick, Jesse, I think that's important. It's an important distinction to make between the psychology of hell and the ontology of hell. I think it's very helpful to focus yeah. on the psychology of hell, too, because what a lot of people neglect is that hell and sin are tightly bound together. And that's right here, right now. You can walk in hell or you can walk in heaven. And a lot of us walk in the former yeah. uh, by this self-imposed misery, by yeah. you know this perpetual sinning that we never try to curb. You know, We just keep walking yeah. in corruption. So I think it's certainly important to focus on the here and now as well. So that, yeah. that, was, that was great. Yeah. So I would, I would be so bold, you know, without being a Bible scholar. I mean, I'm just, you know, we're two guys sharing. Right personal opinions <laughs> I mean, based on a lot of reading and thinking and we care and all of that but um yeah i'd be so bold as to say that jesus jesus taught a, a veiled universalism so he's talking about the annihilation of evil and of our mm -hmm. evil selves and he's talking about that up front that's the explicit most visible message across the teachings of christ is an annihilation of our evil selves um but just beneath the surface, there is um, this constant, you know, Christ both has some language about um, that you've pointed to recently, you know, mm -hmm. uh, us um, <clears throat> knocking on the door of heaven, which the gates of Revelation say will never be shut. Right. I mean, right. The Revelation said that, you know, the, the gates of the New Jerusalem that descends as a bride from heaven uh, will never be shut. That people will come and go. You know, there'll be no night. They'll travel in and out all day you know, all day and all night. Mm -hmm. But um, there is there are these devastating passage or passages where Christ is saying, you know, um, you'll be knocking at the gates and I won't know you. But then there are other teachings where he's saying, um, you know, I'm knocking on your gate constantly, you know, open the door, let me in. Right. So, um, I think that um, that Christ is veiling. He's meeting us where we're at. I mean, we're in hell. You know, yeah, we're, right. we're, we're utterly um, we're utterly overcome by uh, the powers, um, you know, of this world of our of our the dark the darkness of our own hearts, and um, we are subjugated and confused and blinded. And Christ meets us where we're at, and He says, "You need freedom. You need the kingdom of God to you know to release you." Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a terrible message at one level because we're all oppressors. Uh, we all are. Um, you know, blind and maimed, and we're not necessarily aware of it, you know, so yeah. we don't, we don't, we don't know, we don't realize that we need this judgment of God, we need repentance, and so Christ, mm -hmm. Christ meets us where we're at, and it's not just a simple, you know, air, uh, sweet and, you know, soft message of universal salvation, it's, it's a terrible message of annihilation, and therefore, you know, it's under, it's very understandable that it's been, um, it's been understood in multiple ways across history. Jesus also says, all sin shall be forgiven. I, I forget if that's in Mark or Matthew, uh, yeah, but yeah. he, he says yeah. that. So if all sins yeah. are to be forgiven, you know, what does that yeah. mean? You know, it seems to completely contradict the idea that someone will be tortured forever. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, he does. And, you know, but then he also has this mysterious reference to, uh, right, the, uh, the sin against the Holy Spirit. Mm. You know, that can't mm. be given so these things terrify people and uh and there is it's not as simple you know that unfortunately uh, I, don't, I 
there are profoundly universalist verses and teachings in the teachings of Christ, and as you're referencing. Mm-hmm. But then there are also several that uh, that you <clears throat> you certainly, at the very least, have to say um, it's understandable why people wrestle. You know, it's understandable why C.S. Lewis would say. You know, I love everything about George MacDonald. He's my greatest teacher. And, uh, you know, I, I became a Christian. I mean, Lewis virt- virtually says in multiple places, I became a Christian because of George MacDonald. When he, Lewis, uh, you know, the great divorce that I've already referenced, mm-hmm. Lewis imagines himself falling asleep at his desk with his books. He, like he, his head hits the desk and a, and a few books like fall off onto the floor. And he, as he's snoring on his desk, he has a dream. And it's actually Dante's, Dante's uh Lewis dreams himself through Dante's own journey um, into paradise and um, God's presence. And when he's in heaven at the end of this journey, this Dante-esque journey, it, it, the final guy that he receives is George MacDonald. And so George MacDonald is his great teacher in this life and then becomes his guide. And he's the one that teaches Lewis how, how to live in heaven, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. with it's... all of that, Lewis confronts him in heaven. It's, it's almost comical and it's like, well, you were wrong about one thing, universalism, right? I mean, literally in the story and uh, in George MacDonald, Lewis sort of re, uh, corrects his teacher in, in that, on that one doctrine. Elsewhere, Lewis says, I, I would love to be universalist, but um, Christ so clearly teaches otherwise you mm-hmm. know, that, that I can't. So Lewis was an annihilationist. And that kind of thing is understandable because the verses, uh, you know, the, the teachings of Christ cut both ways um so intensely and with such powerful imagery yeah that's great um okay here so what are some scriptural passages that indicate universalism so we touched on a few there but if you want to incorporate a few more yeah i mean i'll just mention there's there's many and and, yeah yeah, you and i both read uh that all should be saved uh Mm -hmm. i think heart heart has a great list there maybe we can share that but, um, and, and there's so many good books on this topic, uh, you know, the, but the, uh, oh, good, you've got it right there. Yeah. yeah I, the most famous, I'll mention one, then you, you give some more. Um, sure. You know, the, the kind of, um, I think, central one is where Paul talks about um, when Christ has subjugated all to the Father and God shall be all in all. It's in uh, First Corinthians chapter 15. There's this sequence where, you know, by the time you get to the end of it and that particular Greek phrase, God being all in all, it's yes. a, uh, it's an incredibly, the grammar of that is so demanding, uh, you know, mm-hmm. all is repeated twice and it's not, it's, um, <clears throat> it's God being, you know, not, not only the, the, the present with all, but the source of all <laughs> so that uh, evil has no place whatsoever. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. The, there's um, multiple passages, but that one kind of stands out in my mind. Yeah, this is pretty similar from John twelve thirty two, and I when I and I when I am lifted up from the earth will drag everyone to me. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, John twelve forty seven. For I came not that I might judge the cosmos, but that I might save the cosmos. Mm-hmm. And I mean, for any for everyone watching right now, this is that all shall be saved by. David Bentley Hart, and he has just pages upon pages of just universalist passages here yeah. uh, that seem to be implying it. But anyway, yeah. if you're just going to play a numbers game, you know, I, I <laughs> the, the universalist passages win. Although, you know, yeah, it's been such a contentious topic for 2,000 years of Christian history, sadly, that, uh, you know, everybody's people wouldn't even agree on that. But I, I think uh, right. if you could step back out of the all the massive um, emotional baggage and whatnot, uh, the numbers game, I do think the universal passages win. So I have a quote here from Keith DeRose, and he says, I judge the support strongly enough that if I had to choose between universalism and anti-universalism as the position position of scripture, I would pick universalism as the fairly clear winner. Mm -hmm. So expanding upon your, your previous point there. Okay, so question five. Why is universalism believed by so few? Yeah. Um, you know, this is obviously related to the question about mm-hmm. why did it uh, virtually disappear, which, which it did. Um, yeah. And, you know, we both, we both had a few thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think the best answer to this is 
the same answer you were giving, you know, they're just the kind of psychological, the dark psychological reasons we have for hanging on to the idea of, um, you know, someone getting locked up forever, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, even in this world's uh, court system, you can understand the mother or the father who, you know, the, whose child's been murdered and uh, they want justice. Now, <clears throat> it's not, it's not um, the ultimate, the healthy thing for us, you know, but you can yeah. understand that, that urge to say, I, I want to mm -hmm. see that person, you know, on, on the electric chair or whatever, you know, the, yeah. ter the terrible kind of outcome might be. So I do think, um, I think that's part of it. Um, but really the history of the church, um, it's, it's people who take the Bible seriously and who take, you know, these are good things taking in my estimation, you know, taking the Bible seriously is a very good thing. Uh, people who take church authority seriously, which I also do so that, you know, if the councils of the church, uh, have condemned universalism. So the question is, you know, why do so few people believe it? Um, it's because it's been, um, exegeted out of scripture. And it's been condemned by, you know, the great authority of, of saints who have lived holy lives and taught infernalism. You know, so you have all these mm -hmm. men and women who have lived incredibly um, generous, sacrificial, holy lives and taught explicitly in infernalism. Mm -hmm. And then you have councils who have said, you know, any version of uh, universalism is a now um, the Fifth Ecumenical Council is the only one uh, in, you know, in my tradition that would be recognized that's made that, um, that kind of a condemnation. And of course that's contested, um, you know, but I'm speaking from the perspective of most Christians who just, you know, assume these historical facts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's why so few people believe. Now there's good evidence that um, that was not always the case. And, and of mm -hmm. course this is contested too, but you have these, these little comments by St. Basil the Great, um, and the grammar of it really makes it look like when he says, um, you know, that most people around me are universalists. I'm, I'm in a minority. Um, and, you know, that, that comment gets all kinds of, you know, scholarly attention and, and contention one way and another, but it sure looks like, I'm not a Greek scholar, you know, but it sure looks yeah. like uh, Basil is saying that, um, the majority of people were universalists or believed in a kind of universal restoration of some form or another in his day. And, um, and then, you know, Basil, uh, or Basil's very best friend that he went to school with, I've already mentioned Gregory of Nazianzus, explicitly says, look, I could teach a deeper mystery, right? but I'm going to teach hell and destruction because that's what we need to hear. Um, you know, so he, he kind of has this wink, wink passage, very similar to Maximus, the confessor. And, and you see this in a couple other places where um, there's a pastoral responsibility that is felt to say, I need to expose our, um, our need for God, our waywardness, our blindness, how hurt and wounded we are mm -hmm. and need of healing. And I'm going to talk about, um, you know, the need for repentance and, God, and God's judgment. And I'm not going to go further to the fact that uh, ultimately um, the gospel has to imply a universal restoration because so that that um, that kind of veiled nature of it even if you can make a good case even in the teachings of Christ himself universalism is veiled it's not you know you read mm -hmm. some passages from the gospel of John which mm -hmm. by the way is kind of considered the holy of holies of the gospels themselves uh, liturgically but um you weren't very early in the church. You weren't allowed to read the Gospel of John until after you'd been baptized. So it was mm. like the inner sanctum, you know, of the Gospels. But anyway, the, um, the if if this universal restoration is veiled and then ultimately gets rejected in in some wrong ways in history and um, is exegeted out of the Bible and um, condemned as heresy, then you understand why you know vast majority. Yeah. Of christians across Absolutely. The it's it's be, it's become a dogma yeah especially among believers yeah now i, I will say people who do not believe in christianity or, or god for that matter um you know they don't believe this right on the face this idea of hell that you're tortured forever um so among people like that they, they were just rejected on the face and I, I think that they're right for doing so <laughs> yeah
Okay, question six. So what are some reasons to reject ECT and annihilationism? So we, we kind of touched upon it a little bit, but. Yeah, the, um, I mean, I, I would ultimately point to, you know, for, in, in my own case, uh, as a Christian, to the teachings of Christ and, uh, and the early, you know, the, the New Testament writers and, and the early writers um, in, in church history, there's a lot of reason to believe that the gospel just isn't about eternal conscious torment at all. Uh, it wasn't even the concept that Paul had. That's the majority consensus among scholars today. Uh, and so this thing that wasn't even a concept for Paul is now, you know, understood by so many Christians today, probably the majority of Christians, as a fundamental truth, like you said, a dogma. And um, so we should, uh, we should, you know, we should course correct. Um, and uh, that's that's a. Um, but there are also just ethical, right, and moral, mm -hmm. and psychological reasons. It, it's a profoundly um, devastating and unhealthy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and for anyone who's got some kind of moral sensitivity, you know, uh, um, moral sympathy, it's, it's, it's not just an unhealthy thing to carry. It's a terrible burden, right? It's a devastating burden to carry. So there, there um, I think David Ben the Hardin that all should be saved tells a story of a young, you know, acquaintance, a child in a family that he knew who was, um, just like psychologically scarred, you know, uh, mm -hmm. When he first heard about the idea of eternal conscious torment, it, it, it like drove him insane. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, and, uh, it's disturbing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because the majority of humanity, according to this paradigm, is going to be tortured forever yeah. and God will refuse a relationship with them. And what's disturbing to me about annihilationism and eternal conscious torment is this notion that you can just be condemned eternally for just mere disbelief for being yeah. agnostic uh who's exercising his intellect up against the mystery of being yeah um or you know take uh, a muslim woman who engages in charity she's very loving and she just so happens to be a part of a different faith well she's condemned forever yeah. uh, just just from that yeah. and you know we're, we find ourselves on this little pale blue dot as sagan has said <laughs> Um, and, you know, we have uh, the capacity to doubt, to wonder, to entertain different ideas. So it's, it's no wonder that people are going to believe different things. Yeah. You know, so again, just on the face, it, it seems yeah, logically nonsensical and incomprehensible and on just vast levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are, um, I mean, we live in a, in a day and age in, in American politics and American kind of, um, culture where everything gets um you know polarized and turned into you know black and white issues <clears throat> there are some nuances there where like uh, my priest my own priest in my parish is um does not believe in universalism and he's told me that um you know the fifth ecumenical council condemned uh, that and uh, and that that you know uh, that's a heresy that some saints have held <laughs> you know so, um, and he doesn't bar me from the communion table. I mean, it, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm I'm just a layperson, you know, struggling struggling through the world. But the um, but despite that, he has said in a sermon, right, that um, that he believes that there are so many good-hearted atheists out there who are doing just what you've described, which is um, making a moral and an intellectual judgment. You know, taking all the evidence they can looking at the rep, you know, the description of God that they've heard, everything they've received as far as who God is, and then looking at the state of affairs, you know, in the world. Right, and, right. And, and he, my priest says, look, I believe, and he, he always has these funny little, he'll have like a smile and, and say, you know, this is a, this is an, a, a me original, you know, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't proper Christian theology, but I'll tell you what I think. And, um, and he says, I believe that all these atheists are going to encounter the true God, the loving God, and they're going to realize that um, they had been given terrible distortions of God at one level and um, and never been um, given any opportunity to um, 
you know, see, you know, to see actual love from Christians. They just got, you know, doctrine and, yeah. you know, you know, you're wrong and all this kind of mm-hmm. either intellectual, um, you know, bigotry of a certain type or, or a representation of, a, of God that is, you know, based in like a legal judge of the fundamental nature of who God is, um, which is so wrong and distorted. So he says, basically, I believe all atheists are going to get a free pass. Like they, they just like back to ground zero when they actually encounter Christ, encounter God, you know, after death, um, they get a whole fresh start. Like they get, get to ask all the questions all over again. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, and, you know, and they're going to, you know, most of them are going to choose God and, uh, and a whole bunch of us Christians are going to realize, you know, Oh my goodness, we, we completely, you know, misrepresented Christ and God in, in a thousand, you know, small ways, <laughs> in the way we, you know, responded to people and our arrogance and all this stuff. So, He's like the tables are going to be turned, you know, on the other side of, of the grave. Um, we're going to we're going to find that a whole bunch of us are arrogant uh, misrepresenters of God, bigots. And, uh, you know, and atheists are pure hearted, you know, pursuers of the truth. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's not as if everyone who believes universalism even is a good person and everyone who rejects universalism is, you know, is all bad. There's a lot of nuances there in terms of um how and i mentioned c.s lewis teaching you know um there's a there's some teaching out there about uh exclusivism right versus inclusivism as far as your relationship to jesus christ and do you you know does that extend beyond death um um, all of that kind of thing and um we tend to turn the whole issue of universal salvation into too much i think of a black and white issue sometimes by um only thinking in kind of contemporary American evangelical categories of, you know, have you, <clears throat> it's an all or nothing proposition. Um, yeah. This right. Is, and yeah, and I, I also think a lot of people too, I've heard William Lane Craig say this, that, you know, you have the choice. God gives you the choice. So God, you know, extends uh, a choice to us to choose yeah. something so incredibly mysterious, so foreign yeah. to finite minds, this notion of hell, your eternal destiny yeah. or, or your or your eternal life. And, you know, by that logic, it just kind of rests on arcane points of honor and, and power instead of concern for the goodness of God's creatures and uh, salvation and, you know, the restoration yeah. it, it really rests on this kind of, it seems psychopathic uh, wrath that God just desires to impose upon finite uh, minds. Well, that's, that's the one side is the wrath, but the, that, uh, that question of God gives us free choice, um, Mm -hmm. you know, isn't like, that's where my priest, for example, would, he would say like, even after God's reset the table completely, you know, and Christians turn out to be the bad guys and atheists turn (laughs) out to be the good guys. Right. Still, some of us on both sides of all these lines are going to choose hell. And that's mm-hmm. like yes, Lewis is famous line that you know that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. God's right. like unbolt those doors, throw them open, and and, and the people yeah. I'll keep keep shutting the doors and locking them. And that's psychologically like true. Like that's what Yeah, we're... it could be. But I, I would I would concur with Hart that a rational soul cannot yeah reject god forever yes. Uh, yes. so that we could draw a distinction between negative liberty and positive liberty where yes. negative liberty yes. you know is freedom of just all of these indeterminate choices you yeah. could just choose yeah. anything yeah. and you're free from constraint whereas yeah. positive liberty and this is what i would align with the yeah. classical moral metaphysical tradition uh yeah. christianity is you positive liberty is where you become who you really are and yeah. in terms of rational spirits it's to become in union with god or yeah. aligned with the good yeah. and in this life due to sin you know you could just take the problem of evil religious pluralism there's just so much going on that that window is tainted and we cannot fully become actual yeah you know so i, I yeah i, I totally i totally yeah. agree i mean I'm, I'm playing you know playing the devil's advocate yeah yeah <laughs> a little but to point out that um that's i think that's a line of thinking about free will that a lot of people get stuck mm. in but david bentley hart is brilliant on this that yeah and as it, as you were just saying we um we don't understand what freedom is um when no. we stuck down that line of 
you know, to be to be constantly closing the doors on God, you know, from this place of suffering, that's not um, that's not a capacity that and it, that's an incapacity. You know, that's that's a profound um, brokenness and a profound blindness. And um, so, yeah, I think um, you <clears throat> if you go down that path, you have to end. And this is where C.S. Lewis, he says, you know, the doors of hell are closed from the inside. But he ultimately heads toward an annihilationism because anyone who's mm -hmm. going to keep locking the doors of hell from the inside is right. ultimately rejecting their own personhood, rejecting their own capacity mm -hmm. to produce anything good. And there's an infinite amount of good choices in God, right, in the life of God. So they could open the doors of hell and begin to make free choices. And, you know, that's pursuing life. But um, but so C.S. Lewis would ultimately go to a kind of you uncreate you uncreate yourself, um, yeah, yeah. as it were. But um, I, but that I, doesn't, it just doesn't make sense of our experience together now because you see goodness in people. You know, Dostoevsky talks about um, someone who is condemned to hell. You know, at the final judgment in, in some kind of a uh, proverbial, in, in some kind of a folk you know folk story in one of his novels and. Uh, but one of the angels sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering the story, so I'm just going to sort of tell it my own way. But one of the angels like pipes up, you know, kind of like, well, wait a minute, you know, they were headed to hell. But remember that one time. So this is a totally monstrous person, okay? Um, they're powerful. They've abused. Um, I mean, they're, they're like basically like a lord who's, you know, lorded it over some kind of surf, surfs and uh, been <laughs> terribly, right. terribly, um, a, just a terrible person. But one time, evidently, in their life, this person had some kind of compassion and gave like a rotten onion to a starving person. OK, so like hardly an act, you know, they're they've got all the money in the world, but they did they did something generous. And um, and there's this image that Dostoevsky uses where he's like that if they hang on to that rotten onion, they will be pulled out of the fires of hell. Um, so, you know, the idea that on um, this one tiny act of compassion and generosity in, um, in within the life of a terrible person reveals to us something about who they truly are. Wow. Yeah, it, that's pretty fascinating. It, it's yeah. It's going to be expressed in their eternal participation in our life together in God. Right. And one more point, too. We're always aligned with the good. We're always pursuing the good, even if we pursue it in such a way, uh, you know, that it's spoiled goodness. Yeah. You know, so yeah. could could a soul really reject the good forever? You know, it, eventually it might say, eh, you know, I'm kind of tired of being a uh, selfish hedonist. You know, I think I'm going to come toward God now. You know, yeah. so yeah. Um, yeah. Let me see here if I had anything else to add. Oh yeah, I did want to just touch upon again. I know we brought this up earlier, but this notion of eternal conscious torment and annihilationism. There's no room for moral improvement. Or it's it, there's no reformatory measure by God. Um, do you what do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, I agree. I don't think that um, I don't think Scripture teaches. Um, I don't I don't think Scripture teaches us a lot at all about what what takes place after death. It is it, for some reason an intentional mystery, but it doesn't teach that it's the end of you know um, of our of our of our journey as uh, spiritual beings you know so um that that reality that um we're making free choices um doesn't change and so we're going to as you said we're going to continue to have this um dynamic of every even a choice even a wrong choice <clears throat> is a broken um incapacitated attempt to pursue the good and that would continue mm -hmm. for free rational creatures um, after death. And, uh, and so we would continue to have the opportunity ultimately, um, to respond to God's love and absolutely, to, to, you know, mm -hmm. repent. So, um, a saint that I love, uh, and a recent saint, um, uh, uh, was beloved as elder Sophronia. This is now Saint, uh, Sophronia in the Orthodox tradition was, uh, uh headed up an abbot of a, a monastery in the United Kingdom. And a famous French theologian, um, Olivier Clément, asked him, you know, will all be saved? This uh, an Orthodox theologian asking a, an elder in a monastery who was much, much loved, who's now, you know, passed away and, and has many years later been uh, um, called a saint. So Elder Sophronia answered and said, um, as long as there's anyone in hell, 
Christ will be there with them. So that's, I mean, I, I think actually related to the question you're asking, which is um, God's presence um, in, in the form of Christ's own um, participated, par participatory love, you know, with our suffering mm -hmm. doesn't right. change. That can't change. That's who God is. And our own, um, <clears throat> our own capacity to, um, well, everything we do is ultimately an attempt to find the truth of goodness, no matter how broken and how um, incomplete and um, confused and blinded it is. And ultimately, we will find Christ. You know, our hand will brush his. And, uh, you, know, in, you know, in that image of sitting together and how the last person in Christ, <laughs> um, ultimately, we'll, that person will find Christ and, and realize his love for them, his presence with them. And, uh, and, you know, they'll unlock the doors of hell that they lock from the inside, right, and, and walk out. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think you're right that um, it just makes no sense um, to think of it as, you, it, it's logically impossible to imagine some kind of a, you know, after death, um, there's, you know, either God's not present anymore or, um, or we aren't free rational agents who are pursuing, you know. Absolutely goodness and beauty and and david has said before that persons will only ever begin to suffer you know so there is no stage mm -hmm. when you're in hell where you'll say yeah you know i've been i've been down here for quite a while i only have a year or two left mm -hmm. um you just begin you're it, it, there's no point there's no rationale to it there's no yeah. there's no end um, it just is, Hey, you missed the ticket. You were a part yeah. of the wrong camp. Now yeah. you got to suffer forever yeah. and you didn't even have to do anything, yeah. uh, viciously evil, you yeah. just being an agnostic, you know? <laughs> so I, I, I cannot square it up upon my mind yeah. at that's all, why, no matter how hard I try. Yeah. That's why Christ teaches the kingdom of God is now it's always now it's always available. Exactly. You know? And yeah. uh, it, it just, a turn toward God brings the kingdom of God. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Jesse, a lot of people have said to me, "Well, Eric, you know, you you have you have limitations, moral and epistemological limitations, and God is good. You know, He knows what He's doing." Um, but I, I don't think these people have really thought through these arguments and the logical ends of these arguments, where they take us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I totally relate to those people because I spent so many years being exactly. Right. I, saying exactly those kinds of things to my own students you know so mm -hmm. um i was a yeah. theology i taught theology to high school students for uh, you know decades and uh, and said those kinds of things um so i totally relate but i think you're right that um <clears throat> when you begin to be released from the sense that like i can't think about this because this is what jesus teaches you know i can't think about the yeah. because and you and and you do, and you do begin to be allowed to think about it. You're right that it's just irrational. All these kinds of um, uh, justifications they make God into a monster. You know that, they do. They do. You know, and is, I think if oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I mean I, I was done. Yeah. Oh, okay. They, <laughs> and I think too, if you really sit down with someone and you go through these arguments and you know you, you push all the way to the end of what this would actually look like what this actually entails, that it's going to become morally and logically unintelligible. Yeah. And if it is, you probably have done something wrong. Maybe you need to look into it a bit more. Yeah. Think about it differently. Consult different scholars on these matters. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, so you're, you know, you're approaching it from a totally legitimate and, uh, and understandable, but also kind of contemporary American perspective where like, everybody's free to make their own intellectual choice and uh and i and i think we're we are free and, and ultimately responsible to do that but i come from more of a perspective where we're and we're enmeshed in kind of bound up in community and uh you know so i i receive the eucharist with my priest uh you know who doesn't who's not a universalist and uh i still always try to make you know point out that um it's a kind of bondage, uh, in my in my opinion, and and I, and it's one I have a lot of compassion for, and don't you know? So I, I don't push to that rational end very aggressively, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like I, 
I mean, no one in my, I'm the oldest of nine kids and I love all my brothers and sisters. I have like, wow, 20, nine. <laughs> 20, I think we're up to maybe 25, you know, nieces and nephews or something. I'm the only universalist in the whole crew. So really? Like, wow. At, <laughs> I mean, at family yeah. reunions and stuff, I'm not saying, you know, well, let's ask this le- next logical question and this, yeah. next, you know, and let's right. get to the point where you're reduced to absolutely, you know, irrational, uh, you know, yeah. meltdown, you know, like, Okay, you just you know you just made God out to be an absolute master. You, you see that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I can't you know you can't live that way at one yeah. level. Um, no, yeah. Mm-hmm. Participating in real church communities, you know, if you're a Catholic or, or Orthodox or um, even Anglican, um, there's going to be contention over these things, and uh, you know, so I I, um, I totally agree with you, and mm-hmm. I I you know I am a universalist, but um, I also kind of understand like why uh, for orthodox people it's actually the free will issue that's like they're so there's this doctrine in orthodoxy that's true good and beautiful that uh that salvation is is a synergy we have to work together with god in our own so we participate in our own salvation which in my upbringing was like anathema you know it's like you know um any talk of participating in your own salvation just sounded profoundly idolatrous or um um, um, just so wrong at, at a level of kind of elevating yourself to, you know, being a, a worker with God. But I, be, I believe that um, is such a beautiful and, and critical truth. Now, it is mm-hmm. um, the icon of the resurrection. You know, Christ reaches out. He's got them by the wrist as he pulls them out of, out of their tombs. Uh, it's an image of uh, Adam and Eve, and he's pulling them out of the, out of the grave, literally. Um, but they've reached their hands up to him, you know, so that's the, that's orthodox people often talk about that as kind of a great image of synergy. We have to extend an arm and, uh, but it's Christ who has the power to grip us by the, uh, their hands are like lint, but they mm-hmm. are, they are holding their arm out. And, um, so the orthodox reject universalism because they insist that we're always, um, we have to make a true choice and we have to, you know, we've talked about that already. Right. Uh, what it what is the true yeah, yeah, the nature is, of the choice yeah. itself. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But I, you know, for all these different reasons, you're convinced that it just can't be what Christ mm-hmm. teaches. You're convinced that, you know, our synergistic, um, you know, free, rational <clears throat> life with God, um, you know, you have a misunderstanding of the freedom that says you well, it has to allow for ultimately for rejection. Um, for it to be truly, you know, a synergy, a free relationship with God. I, I sort of, I understand all these reasons why people yeah. can't um, open their mind to, you know, um, to the exegetical and the theological arguments uh, for universalism. I wanted to add one more thing, Jesse, too. I wrote an article about hell, why you even have children. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've been thinking about lately is, you know, there are parents who are, firmly held in this conviction that if you don't believe that jesus is the son of god you are damned for eternity consciously and i kind of i I question how they can bring children into the world you know Mm -hmm. because they're at least partially culpable (laughs) if not fully in a sense if you know that just by being an agnostic my my son could be an agnostic one day he's doomed and this kind of ties in with what David Bentley Hart has said before that if really pressed through, they don't really believe that they believe it. Yeah. You yeah. know, so that's something that I've been thinking about lately, how parents who really believe this could bring children into the world, because I certainly would not. Yeah. If I thought that my child could be eternally tortured in this chamber that God has constructed, I, I would not have children personally. I, I think you're right. And I think David Bentley Hart is right that ultimately um, we haven't admitted we haven't admitted to ourselves in, in those kinds of situations that we don't believe what we what we think we believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, I spent many years believing that uh, anyone who you know was an agnostic or an atheist would have to go to hell because they had died, you know, refusing to say you know Jesus is Lord and uh, you know all of all of. Uh, acknowledge the truth in those ways and um but with friends who i knew and 
and all of that, there was a secret place in my heart that the biggest I could get was hoping C.S. Lewis was right, right? That, that mm -hmm. there was a chance after death, you know, that. Right. You know, but for me, in my very kind of, uh, or, you know, early upbringing, I had a very exclusivist understanding of salvation where, you know, you had to make that profession of faith mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ before you died, or you were, you were, it was right. an eternal conscious torment. But I also knew enough about it and had read the Chronicles of Narnia and all that multiple times. And so, but, and I, but I technically thought, you know, Lewis was getting a little into some theologically dangerous territory there. You know, that's kind of how I'd been taught. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I held on to it as, as, as a secret, almost like a secret place in my heart. I was like, officially, this is what I believe. Atheists are going to hell. But secretly in my heart as a child or, or a young man, I was, I was like, I'm really hoping Lewis is right, that they get a second chance, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and I think it's even bigger than that, like you're saying, that ultimately um, you, any kind of, uh, of a belief in an eternal conscious torment um, as a part of the, the eternal life of God mm -hmm. has got to be a kind of self-delusion. Yeah, yeah. And... You know, the intrinsic beauty of life, one could push back and say, well, it's just worth it to have children anyway, just yeah. so they can experience the beauty of life. Life is yeah. intrinsically better than non-life. Yeah. Well, while that may be true, uh, well, once you usher in this notion of eternal conscious torment, that overrides any kind of, you know, oh, there, there, there's just no reason to bring a child into this life if yeah. that is well, even possible. <laughs> we live our we live our lives though in a, we live our lives in a kind of practical reality that isn't connected to our abstract ideas as mm -hmm. much as we as we think. Um, we're not as rational or as you know or as consistent with our with our um, principles and abstract you know dogmas and whatnot as we think we are. So I I just think you're right that people have lived for generations with this dogma that would literally make it horrific to, to you know, take that risk of sending a child to eternal conscious torment. But the, the reality of, um, of the beauty of life on a day-to-day -day basis, more often than not now, even, even amidst suffering, life is beautiful, you know, um, there's, I would agree. you know, and uh, that kind of existential um, reality, uh, phenomenological reality wins out. You know, so, so right. we, you know, we end up loving someone, we end up loving a child and wanting the child to have the opportunity to love others. And, you know, you have children because of the experience of love and beauty and joy uh, that you, you want to um, perpetuate, you know, you want to um, share. And, yep. and that's deeper than our dogmas, you know, uh, but people, people don't, people can't uh, confront that fact that that it is a profound uh, conflict um, with you know the the experience of life that um, that is sort of more real to us than our, our dogmas. Um, we can't we can't put the we can't actually um, you know analyze that conflict. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not you know I wouldn't ascribe to antinatalism. You know, I I, I think although it's a strong argument in certain respects. Um, so I agree with you that in the face of suffering, life is still better than non-life. And there's this example from the philosopher Justin Mooney. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of him? Um, yes, I have. Yeah, I well, he, example you're talking about. Though. Yeah, yeah. So he talks about the rainforest and the Amazon. And mm -hmm. uh, if you had a, the opportunity to press a button to annihilate it, would you do it? You know, you know, there's a lot of suffering. Most people would not do it. Yeah. Why? You know? Yeah. It, it seems to imply that there's something better about the intrinsic nature of, of life and, and beauty than suffering. Yeah. Now I totally agree with that. But when you, like I said, when you usher universe or I'm sorry, uh, eternal conscious torment into the picture, that just seems like the evil of all evils. Yeah. And, and I just, you, you run a very serious risk of, of having children, especially for those who are fully convinced of it. You know, yeah. like I said, I've spoken to many, parents that say oh no i totally believe that you know you are yeah. going to hell forever and i've asked them yeah are you concerned about your children they might just not believe this one day and yeah. you know so yeah this uh leads into my next question right here jesse are there any good arguments for eternal conscious torment i mean the only one 
in my mind is is you know if you're so convinced that um, it's what Jesus Christ taught, mm -hmm. I can, I can relate I can relate to that mis misunderstanding you know of Christ's teachings because um, there are a few passages, um, one that you and I have talked about briefly that I do think is one of, one of the most compelling where Christ talks about um, standing. Uh, us coming and knocking you know on the on the doors of of the kingdom and god saying to us i never knew you you know where yeah. did you come from you don't come from a place i know you know mm -hmm. yeah, that's but i think that points in a kind of annihilationist direction more than anything else it, it's literally saying you come from nowhere you're not my creature you know i don't know the place you're i don't know your origin like um which points to a kind of um you know you've left yourself out of reality um, i don't think any of that holds water i don't think that's an understanding of the passage but when you when you take passages like that um i can relate to why people would interpret them you yeah, have to have pile them, you know, combine that with, uh, with something about you know the outer darkness and the gnashing the weeping and the gnashing of teeth all these are words of christ and you it's understandable why people feel like okay the love of christ binds me like that's that's a powerful thing and uh and he also teaches eternal conscious torment you're you're in this profound dilemma then you love jesus understandable you mm -hmm. know why why you would love jesus he teaches eternal conscious torment you're stuck with it and you live in this thing that you can't analyze you live in this you know that we've been talking about that that's rationally untenable um mm -hmm. that would make it you know we make it horrific to imagine putting children at risk and, and bringing them in into a world where they could, be, you know, but, um, but I, I can relate to that very easily. I grew up with it, um, that Jesus yeah. teaching moral conscious comment. I, I don't think it holds water. So your question is, is there a good argument? No, I, I don't agree. Think yeah. I, I, I have not ever encountered a good argument for eternal yeah. conscious torment except for the one you mentioned, you know, yeah. well, it, it's more aligned with annihilationism. Yeah. Now, the only one I could maybe think of is perhaps there are evils so heinous, so gratuitous, you know, akin to Hitler, say. Maybe yeah. in that respect, he's worthy of eternal conscious torment. But I, even for someone like him, I still cannot uh, really accept that. I, I don't think he's worthy of eternal conscious torment. Yeah. Know? And uh, yeah, so uh, aside from those two I, I can't think of any possible argument that would justify it and like i said i've asked many people who are very intellectual people yeah and they just say you know well scripture says it yeah and god is mysterious you know we we we're, we have limitations there's really no solid argument where i would look at the premises and deduce from that that hey this is probably correct yeah i haven't come across one so. Uh, I would agree. I think if you're stuck there exegetically, you know, if you if you, if you can't read the teachings of Christ any other way, um, then you, people just begin making excuses, all of which are really flimsy. You know? Yeah, I agree. I, I would say it comes back to studying, you know, the, the New Testament. So, so read a book, like even though I don't agree with um, everything in, you know, the geography of hell that I mentioned before, it's a great place to start. Like it's a solid it takes the teachings of Christ very seriously in their historical context, you know, with, with reverence for him as a, as a teacher uh, from, you know, I mean, I, I think um, that author is actually, um, I can't remember that, that maybe Jehovah's witness or something, but mm -hmm. um, it's a serious scholar who takes the serious teachings of Christ seriously. And you read scholarship like that and you realize, okay, the, the standard understanding of these texts that I've, um, you know that that have been repeated so many times in so many Sunday school classes and whatnot over the years um, is not at all in line with <laughs> what yeah. uh, makes sense um, of the words in their context. The way Jesus's own hearers would have would have they would not have been they would not have heard him to have been saying what we think he's saying now. Mm -hmm. And that begins to open that begins to open um, the way up for people to potentially. Um, rethink and, and and understand okay all the other stuff i say like god is you know mysterious and above us he's not subject to our moral you know to our kind of yes. moral. Um, he's the source of our moral you know obligation <laughs> right. 
yes, he's not subject to them, but he, he's not he's not able to um, conflict with them because he's the source of them. You know, so like yeah. you, all these flimsy things that people say to sort of excuse God for eternal conscious torment is, is they, they make no sense. And God has to understand, too, that his rational creatures are going to say, hmm, you know, that sounds a little odd. You know, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. mean, I mean, we, we we've developed this moral capacity to question yeah. these things. I mean, yeah. even I mean, it's for another discussion in the future, perhaps. But oh, the Old Testament, all of these horrific passages uh, we come to, you know, people believe, oh, no, these are literal portraits of God. This is coming from his mouth. Mm -hmm. Does he not think we're going to question these things? I, 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 you know. mm -hmm. So, you know, that moral well, capacity right. to question is always there. The greatest saints of the Old Testament do question them. I mean, they argue with God. They say, right. you know, exactly. don't do this. No, spare my people. And they, and they, you know, and those, there's a lot of uh, like a Jewish exegetical tradition where the one, the most saintly thing to do is to dispute with God in those kinds of situations. Yeah, and, right, right. You That's know, a great they, point. You know, an exegetical tradition where Noah wasn't as saintly as, say, Abraham, because Noah didn't dispute with God the flood. He just obeyed him and built the ark. And whereas Abraham was like, no, you can't do this. And, you know, negotiated. Of course, mm -hmm. tomorrow was still destroyed. But the, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot going on there. And uh, <clears throat> you're right that God, you know, God, our father, uh, the true... And, and high God um, expects us to use our minds, expects us to dispute and to call out uh, this kind of falsehood and misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Okay. Now, one more thing before our last question, I'll edit this into question six, but I did want to bring up an analogy from David Bentley Hart. He talks about, you know, imagine you're at a dinner party. Are you familiar with this? Yes. And on the top floor, you're having a party, there's there's beer, there's music, it's just wonderful, you're hanging out with God, it's the best world ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the best party ever, rather. But in the basement, there are people being tormented, and they're locked to, you know, chains yeah. and whatnot. And you know this, though, you know this, yeah. you know, your, your moral intuition is going to tell you, we got to do something about this, we have to free them. Um, but we're told to you know, this is good in god's eyes this is good um so yeah. I, I just thought that was fascinating yeah. you know and, and it runs into further problems too how god could expunge from his mind yeah these persons and remember his mind is constituted in such a way where it's just infinite love yeah yeah and even for 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 us at the party we have to expunge from our minds our loved ones that are being tormented forever and yeah. then, you know, people have said, well, God's actually going to expunge that from his mind and your mind. So you'll just forget them. You see, that is disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that that is a powerful image. And uh, there's some there's several ways uh, in which Hart has shared in both in writing and in, in like interviews about how disturbing is that idea that it mm -hmm. could be, you know, that any person could be expunged from our minds. That's a part of our own, who we are, you know, like. I'm, I'm a product of everyone I've had a relationship with yes, yes. and that, that I could then, you know, I think Hart says something like, you know, God's going to have to make a fake you, you know, in order to, <laughs> to spend eternity with you. If he's putting this other person in, in it, yeah. each conscious torment, um, none of us can be really, you know, who we are. Um, Absolutely. So have you ever heard of the short story? The ones who walk away from Omalas by Ursula K. Le Guin. I have not. She she has uh, very similar to the story of the parable kind of that you told from David Bentley Hart of the, the ultimate party, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, these, these poor souls suffering uh, in chains in the basement, but somehow you're still able to enjoy the party um, mm -hmm. and how horrible that would be. Um, it's a brilliant uh, and, and well-loved short story um, by her, um, you know, about a whole kingdom where uh, it's it's a perfect world. But there's one little child that has to be perpetually kept uh, mm. in darkness in a basement, and the whole the whole flourishing of the kingdom depends on that. And then the ones who walk away from Omalas are like, they it's so horrific. They wander off into the desert to mm. escape the beauty of this perfect kingdom that is somehow sort of powered by this one sacrificed child, not sacrificed on an altar fire, but 
but chained in a basement. Wow, that's powerful. Uh, a human interaction. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a horrifically uh, devastating story uh, and a condemnation of, of, of ultimately of this idea of uh, you know eternal conscious karma. Absolutely, and I just to backtrack a bit, I loved what you said about um, how you know our current selves right now are predicated on a, a cascade of contingencies. I yeah. mean, really imagine certain memories of persons being wiped out of your mind. I mean, you would not be who you are. You wouldn't. No, be. you wouldn't be. You'd, you wouldn't you'd, be. You'd be a, a totally artificial, you know, mm -hmm. um, puppet created out of some pieces of yourself in order to you know um keep keep god happy in heaven forever yeah um, but you wouldn't be who you are absolutely all right so this is the last question here what are the benefits of affirming universalism yeah um for me you know being forced to think about the true nature of freedom that, that we talked about yeah uh, that's been very powerful and my own responsibility, um, my own responsibility in every moment uh, to confront hell in my own heart and to confront uh, the hell that I see other people bound in, you know, without, um, ultimately it is, um, ultimately we're responsible for ourselves and I, I don't think you can sort of, um, <clears throat> you're actually doing yourself or anyone else any good when you're, you mm -hmm too much of a savior complex you know when you're gonna um you're gonna uh set everything right for everyone else but when one one of the great saints says if you if you save yourself you save the world <laughs> um you know that this that this idea that we sh we need to confront the evil in our own hearts and universalism actually um as i've as i have come to understand it in terms of this purgatorial you know reformatory fire that um is going to require me to repent and to do the right thing uh, in the place of every wrong thing that I've ever done. Um, and that that is a, um, that that is something that I'm held to, that kind of a standard is something that I'm held to moment by moment. Um, it's a beautiful thing to be called to. Um, that, that type of freedom, that type of um, capacity, and that vision of be a beautiful life together. Um, you know, so that's, it's wonderful to be called to such a beautiful thing, but it's also um, profoundly sobering uh, in the face of all that I fail, you know, uh, my own self-indulgence and neglect of others and, and all of those things where you're like, uh, uh, it condemns you moment by moment. Um, such a glorious vision um, holds you accountable, um, you know, moment by moment. So I find it just... Um, I have found it to be the opposite of what, you know, the, the uh, I can, I can relate to the concern that a kind of simplistic lib, you know, universalism um, is, can be morally confusing or, you know, sort of let you off the hook. But, but it, as you truly contemplate what God calls us to ultimately, um, it actually has the opposite effect of um, holding me to a, tremendously high standard that I see myself falling short of continually. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that that's both a beautiful calling and a sobering um, call to repentance. So. Yeah. And, you know, what's the point of forming meaningful relationships if the vast majority of them are going to hell forever and you'll never see them again? So I think there's a greater onus on love and love becomes even more crucial and more sacred when you know you're interacting with persons yeah. that you're going to interact with eternally yeah you know so uh, it, it gives me more incentive to you know think about justice and seek justice yeah. um it, it's just it's a beautiful vision yeah and, and everyone should desire that vision you know so yeah i agree so do you have anything else to add or, I think it's been a great conversation. I, I mean, there's always, you know, there, well, <laughs> there's a lot more. We, we could probably talk about this forever. Yeah, know? absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and maybe, maybe in some more positive sense, we will. Uh, absolutely. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Jesse, it was great having you on, man. And I hope we can do this again soon. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eric. It's okay, man.
Take care. Take, take care. You too.